Alright, time for another draftphysics.com, debatephysics.com also, but no one will debate, especially debate in a forum where somebody plays an argument like I'm going to do, okay, and um, points out where the errors are made and the falsehoods are spoken. So, um, you know, in all these years, I've been waiting for somebody to do that to my video, that is... I've made five minute videos just for the purpose to make it easier for somebody to do that. And their obligation would be to actually play the video, not all the way through, like I'll just ignore every point he makes, you know, because I have done a little bit of that. Um, uh, and then they'll comment after I've said five minutes worth of stuff <laughs> and they won't, you know, it's not going to be relevant anymore. Um, but just, yeah, point by point, sentence by sentence point out where the error sentences are and they just won't do it so all these people claiming some uh, superiority in their perspective and their they can't take that simple challenge and perform the task of actually playing my argument and explaining how the argument is flawed so i'm going to do the royal institution that <laughs> privilege of letting it know why I think it's wrong. Yes. Um, anyway, so let's get on with it. Oh, there we are. Uh, there's a bigger image. I have my little arrow in case I need it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is, I think, what <coughs> Lawrence Bragg, who I have all kinds of respect for in terms of being a great, as scientists go, scientist but again he's bought into a bunch of crap that he never really thought about he's just regurgitating the stories he's been told and he didn't really think about it enough to say hey wait a minute there's a flaw in that story now there's a place where it has a continuity error so we'll leave us begin <laughs> during the 1700s there were two views so let me turn it up a little. There's a little static noise, so yeah, it's a little tricky getting the volume right on this one. So he's talking about uh, Newton versus Leibniz and um, Huygens, more specifically. About the nature of light. Huygens and his followers believed that light consisted of waves. And Huygens uh, explained reflection and refraction by his wave picture of light. And the wave picture is this idea that the wave hits a surface and that a oh, part of the wave <laughs> bends and then the rest of the wave follows the part that bent. So it's like one soldier bends and all the soldiers bend. So it turns light into a very um, gooey thing. Uh, you know, some kind of... It's an etherist type theory, not a... Uh, light is made up of discrete quanta theory. It's not a quanta of light, Einstein type theory. The other view was that light consisted of particles, bullets shot out by the luminous body which affected our eyes. Yes, and we should point out, right, that there are bullets at a frequency, that the bullets themselves aren't big bullets and little bullets, that the bullets would be all the same size bullets. So we don't know exactly which way Newton uh, perceived it, frankly. I don't know, anyway. Uh, maybe somebody else can find that in optics somewhere where he describes uh, what he actually believes, whether it's discrete bits, okay, at a frequency, or whether it's a thing that you could make longer or shorter. <laughs> yeah, so I'd argue that once you knew, um, once we knew, because Newton didn't know it, that radio waves, you know, that the spectrum had this much larger spectrum, you know, that it went to these l much larger frequencies and much smaller frequencies. I think the idea of it being bits, bullets, actual same size bullets at a frequency uh, becomes a very um, reasonable speculation. Uh, yeah. Newton had upheld the particle theory. In justice to him, it must be recognized that he did so very tentatively. So 
So he says it was tentative, and I, you know, I don't think it was that tentative. Uh, he asserted it pretty directly and made arguments against the wave theory. So he directly made arguments against it being waves, and he pointed out that shadows are too sharp, uh, different things that he used as arguments pointing out that wave theory doesn't work. He never expressed himself as quite sure, but on the whole, he thought the part. So, so again, I, I don't, you know, uh, well, whatever. Uh, I don't, I don't see all that in his writing that I've read. I don't see any um, conditional maybe statements. Well, theory was probably the right one, and new. So um, he says Huygens' theory is the right one. His followers. Uh, were far more convinced than Newton was himself. So that's what he says. I'm not sure. Now, towards the end of that century, a famous experiment was made by Thomas Young. So it was, it was exactly the next century, 1801. But anyway. Young's pinhole experiment, which proved that the... So that's the word they use. It proved... And it doesn't do anything like prove. It's not even close to proving anything. It's, again, the simplest pattern you can create in the world, on-off. And yet, <clears throat> they think all things that create an on-off pattern have to be some sort of wave interference. It's like so myopic, you know. It's you know, almost ridiculous that a scientist would make such an assumption. Wave theory was the right one because he showed that light could interfere. So, and again, he didn't show interference. What he showed was just a bar pattern being created. And again, there are other explanations for that. This young is a very remarkable man. He was a doctor, petsing doctor. Yeah, that's all very good stuff. I mean, he was a very good scientist, did lots of things. But this is not one of the good things he did. He's also coined the phrase energy, essentially. He was the first to use it in a public lecture. So um, it makes him notorious in two ways, in my opinion. Uh, it makes him a negative in two ways. He had other literary and scientific interests. It was he who found first the key to interpret the Egyptian hieroglyphics he had done a great deal of work on cap capillarity or surface tension, on elasticity. Some of you may remember Young's modulus of elasticity. He was one of the first to uphold the three-color theory of color vision. And above all, what is so very famous, he did this pinhole experiment, which could only be interpreted if light consisted of waves. So it can only be interpreted so, you know, this is the rhetoric, and it's clearly, where did you try to interpret it some other way? Where did you do your hieroglyphics thing? You know, where you, you, you see if you can find some other way to translate it, like translate it into some other language, and then translate that language into some other language. It's like they didn't try anything in terms of this science besides what they wanted to believe. Now, let me try with this diagram to show you what Young's principle of interference means. Right, and the principle is right on its face, the big fraud. So right from the principle, you can say, oh, they're dr dramatically cheating. It can't work that way. And let's take Young's original pinhole experiment. He made a pinhole on a, in a screen and illuminated it with sunlight, the brightest light he knew. And here, on his wave theory, we must suppose that these waves are coming from the pinhole here, spreading out in this. <laughs> right, and we know in, in photons and light, we already know that the single pinhole creates a, a, a pattern. So right there, game over. Ridiculous. I mean, the single slit is really easy to do, and it creates just as big a bar pattern, just as bright and just as real a bar pattern as the double slit. You can have 70 little on-offs, 
Or you can have four. It, you know, you can vary the whole thing. And Professor Lewin does the experiment, just changes the size of the opening and creates a more and more and more bars. Um, so it's a silly premise. There's no indication that it's obeying any kind of water wave idea. It's completely not consistent. Direction. In the path of these waves, he put two slits, two pinholes, rather, and the waves were allowed to come through those pinholes. So we know that the single slit already creates a pattern. So he's shoving a pattern essentially into another set, but the point is he's only sending the central maxima in, but whatever. It's still, it's still a fact that there's a pattern going to the two slits. All right. Continue. So in this space here, one had two sets of waves, one coming from that pinhole, one coming from that. Right, and so we know it doesn't come from the pinhole. It doesn't, the wave center, the math they use to calculate the correct locations, has the waves on the edges of the surface, not from the center of the openings. And it's only because of this special catch of... Let's make the opening insanely small, so small that there's no distance difference hardly at all between the two surfaces of the slit. Then those two surfaces of point source become one point source. They're no longer, it's no longer a double slit pattern. It's going to be a single slit pattern because you've taken away two of the point sources. You've put them in the, almost the same location and therefore they can't create any interference. That one. Here they are. And now, perhaps you can see what interference means. <laughs> yes, it only means this in water waves. It doesn't mean this in light, because light will not obey the same rules. So I really don't want to have to do the drawing thing again, but maybe I should real quick. Um, maybe I'll draw it, and then I'll show you the drawing. All right, so here are the two patterns. The top being the double slit pattern obviously has two distinctly different patterns. One pattern creating these little bars, one pattern creating these groups of the little bars. And what you can see, if you use a slit arrangement where the center um, is, uh, let's say, smaller than, okay, the slit openings, so something like this, What'll start to happen is, is that you'll start to see a little bit of a faded. This will start showing up a little bit. Okay, so you'll start to see that there's actually another dot in all of these locations. But if you do it where this, the width of this impediment is exactly the same as the slit opening, you'll get a much cleaner version where you won't see anything in between. So it'll make it even more obvious that you are missing at all these locations. And then the more surfaces you add, you create a diffraction gradient and create more and more surfaces. These these points where you're actually getting um, the, the phase becomes more critical. I've drawn this all out, but it, it's basically a pyramid and you're going to understand the pyramid re recycle. So once you go through a certain location, then it peaks again, and then it peaks again, but the distance between those peaks gets further and further apart. So you end up with just little dots separated by a great deal of distance the more lines or surfaces you create. So if you create a, a diffraction gradient with a bunch of lines that have two surfaces each, um, you can then see a pattern where these <coughs> points become more and more distinct and separated by distance because they require all the lines to make a contribution and all the lines only make a contribution in phase at very distant locations. You have to go through a lot of locations before you get to one that says yes everybody agrees with that location. Uh, well that's a subtle point but anyway. And so the real distinct feature is the fact that the single slit provides plenty of pattern and what it has is a central maxima which water waves don't create. Water waves don't make a double maxima. And the double slit has the same phenomenon and you can sort of understand what it's made out of is two nodes overlapping. So if you have three 
in the side node, you're going to have 5 in the center node. So it's always one less than twice the node size. So whatever the node size is, this will be twice that minus 1. Always be odd, indicating it's always a merger of two nodes. Anyway, so that's all. Those are all really important details, and they have nothing to do with their analysis. There's, they're not in the analysis. They don't acknowledge the existence of these actual patterns. And to me, that's pretty egregious in terms of being bad science. Young argued that at a place like this, where the two sets of waves have crests and troughs that agree with each other, in step, as it were, the light will be bright. All right, so in water, there's no double maxima in the center. It's the same size. All the nodes are the same size. And they're also all the same strength. So as you can see, sort of from this diagram vaguely, there'd be no reason for the water traveling this way to be any weaker than the water. Well, I can, you can't see that as well. I'll use the arrow for that, right? All right. So the <clears throat> the water going this way and going this way is just as strong as the water going forward. So there's no difference in the intensity of the wave front. So you should be making bars for a very, you know, right across the screen rather than for this very narrow amount. So it's another indication that the theory is completely inconsistent with waves because waves don't create a diminishing pattern. Um, it's not consistent with the actual pattern that fades, okay, with distance fades with distance side to side. Were the crests and troughs just interleave each other like this, the crest of one destroys the trough of the other and there's nothing. Out here again, they agree and it's bright. So Young said... So obviously water waves also have a more evenness in the sense of the ons and the offs. So where in light it's clear that it accepts a wide range of frequencies and says they're close enough to in phase. So it's big bars of light and little bars of dark and big bar of light, little bar of dark. My fringes, my dark and light stripes where the light overlaps are caused by the interference of these waves. Light, dark, light, dark, light. And so on. And wrong in, <laughs> wrong on. It's just, it's all, it's, again, it's easy to detect that it doesn't happen that way just because of the idea of waves going through the two slits. The measurement would be different than the slit width measurement as long as you don't destroy the double slit pattern by making the slit so thin that there's no difference in light traveling the two distances from the two surfaces. The surfaces are so close together that the vectors from those two lines can't be drawn anywhere where there's a wavelength of difference. No light is ever lost. You gain here where they agree just as much as you lose here where they don't agree. But <clears throat> Yes, that's in water again, but they never proved that in light. And frankly, I guess it'll in this, uh, in his experiment, you'll kind of see an indication that that's also not true. The light splits itself up into these two sets. And Young said this must mean that light's waves and not little bullets or particles. You couldn't get two sets. So that's what he says. And again, the argument is that, of course, if you think about it a little bit, you can see first the waves don't work. And second, you can think about, well, what if I sent bullets through and the bullets were scattered at the surfaces? So every time a bullet went by a surface, it scattered. Well, then I would have places where the two bullets were a wavelength of difference. And I'd have places where the bullets would, you know, be a wavelength of difference in the sense of the frequency. So I shoot them at a frequency from like a machine gun. They hit the surfaces, and I just assume scatter at those surfaces. 
they all end up with bullets landing at one location they'll be out of phase the bullet from one side won't match the bullet from the other side fact the so bullets interfering with each other and cutting each other out but you can get it with waves here then is Young's picture of the effect which he drew when he wrote up a set of lectures which he so he, he drew a few things and yeah, like I said if you look at his actual diagrams they don't match what photons do in terms of what the water compared to the photons he did the waves are coming in through the so if you use point A and point B in a regular two slit experiment that is a slit experiment where the slits are open and you assume a wave is coming out of this slit and a wave is coming out of this slit that distance if you use that in your math from the center of this slit to the center of this slit that only works if you engineer the experiment just right every other circumstance you won't get the right answer so in one case you'll get the right answer in an infinite number of other cases you'll get the wrong answer because the only distance that really matters is the distance between this surface and this surface and the distance between this surface and this surface. These two pinholes here, A and B, they are spreading out in this direction and you'll see all along these tracks there are places where Right, and you'll see the center maxima is not double. It's the same size going all the way. And the fact is it's the same strength. So you can see from his drawing even that they're the same intensity. The center isn't insanely more intense where it, of course it is in the light experiment. You do the light experiment, the center maxima is very, very bright. So it clearly a huge inconsistency with photons versus water waves. And yet they ignore the inconsistencies because they want to believe for some reason. The troughs and the crests alternate so that we get nothing and places in between where they lie on top of each other where you get a strong effect. So it doesn't match either experiment, the single slit or the double slit in the sense of the missing double maxima. And the only way you can create the same size maxima in the center is to <laughs> look at the look at the pattern in a very bizarre manner which he does in this experiment so we'll wait till we get to it so you get these stripes of darkness and light spreading out from here and when they fall on the screen you'll get dark fringes at c d e and f and bright fringes in between and again, the intensity will be incredibly gradient. The center will consume 93% of the photons will hit that center, and only 7% will be in the fringe light. Now, Young explained his principle by his wave trough, by making a trough in which he could set up waves. And again, I have here a picture from Young's book. Here is his source of illumination. Here is his tank filled with water. Unfortunately, he didn't draw the same kind of pictures for how he did the slit experiment. So that's kind of an irony, is that um, to illuminate a um, you know, wave tank experiment, he did a he did a so the tank is is above a, a, a light source and it's a piece of glass, so you can see through it. You can cast an image of it and then view the image not very I mean this is not hardly um, you know a locomotive or something I mean it's not exactly the greatest invention in the history of mankind which has a glass bottom here is the dipper on a spring which vibrated and made the waves and the shadows of these waves were thrown by the light through the glass bottom onto this screen here. So he could set up waves and see how they behave. We've got here Young's original wave trough, made in the year 1800, when he was a professor in the Royal Institution. There is the trough, there's a bright light down below, at the back is a mirror, 
and in front there is a screen on which we can see the waves. Now, if you could just uh, dim down the light, I want to show you uh, Young's wave trough working. So again, and it doesn't duplicate what photons do. So again, it isn't even duplicating what light does, and yet people are demonstrating it as if it, it's showing you what light does when light doesn't do the same thing. Again, the double maxima is so obvious in these experiments, especially the single slit. It's just so obvious. Um, and they're just ignoring it as a fact. I think you can see the shadows of the two dippers, which are like Young's two pinholes. Now, we'll set those going. They'll send out waves. And I hope you can see spreading out the... So again, <coughs> same size, same size, same size, same size. Not the pattern you actually get from any of the slit experiments. So it's just not the truth. It certainly isn't what he saw, isn't what he draw when he did the light experiment. So there's a huge inconsistency. And then again, once you establish the mathematical relationship, it becomes even more obvious that wave centers will fail to get you the correct answer. You have to put the waves on the surfaces. So there's the wave center has to be the surface math will get you the right answer, not the uh, math to a wave center. The bright and draft fringes exactly as in Young's picture. So they're really not exact. Well, yes, his picture's of this. His picture isn't of photons. His picture is of waves. This is what he drew a picture of. So the picture was a picture of this. It wasn't a picture of anything he saw photons do. And again, the intensity is the same in each one of these, the exactly same intensity. It's just so obvious that the slit pattern doesn't do anything like that. Now, if I could have the lights on again, please. This is so important a principle, I'd like to illustrate it in another way, with sound this time, I've got here... So it's just as bad as using water, it's just another medium, and the wavelengths are even bigger now, okay, which makes it even sloppier, but whatever. Uh, two speakers, and by making the connection here, I can make those both sound at a very high frequency. They're in parallel, so they are beating in unison, like the light coming through those two pinholes. Two sets of waves are coming out. They will cross over where Mr. Coates is over there. And I hope when he moves the microphone he's holding backwards and forwards, you can hear it passing through the uh, places where the sound is strong and where it is weak. The Again, no central double maxima. The sound fringes if we like to put it in that way. Now perhaps we might run through them rather more quickly. There, I hope you heard uh, these sound beats. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't much of a difference, was it? Probably could have done that experiment better, but anyway. Moving on. Now, I'll turn off that thing. We'll uh, try and uh, uh, demonstrate the same effect in a rather amusing way with a sensitive flame. I'll switch off the speakers for a moment and uh, show you how this flame works. Uh, I've got here a flame which is almost on the point of roaring. It's just not. And any sort of high note uh, makes it roar, as you may have noticed while I'm speaking. It just rattled the cash in my hand. Sister Susie sewing shirts for soldiers. You see how it dips every time at the high-pitched S noise. Well, we'll switch on the two... <laughs> this is kind of funny. Well, anyway, okay, so now he's going to test the sound with this more um, sensitive device that's basically theater because yeah obviously there's something controlling the flame and that controller could 
do any number of things in terms of creating an effect. It doesn't have to do this flame thing. Speakers again, uh, they will form a fringe field over in the neighborhood of that flame. And now, as Mr. Coates moves the flame backwards and forwards, uh, we will see the flame ducking up and down as it goes through the light and dark fringes, the points of high intensity and low intensity, right. Again, no double maxima. Ba -ba -boom, ba -boom. And they could do the experiment by putting one of the speakers on the other side. So they have the two speakers facing each other. And the idea of interference is kind of, uh, you know, what could that possibly mean? And just move the object this way, and they'll get the same pattern. <laughs> because it just has to do with in phase and out of phase doesn't have anything to do with anything interfering. Uh, you will have seen how the flame ducked down and went high again uh, as Mr. Coates moved it through the fringes caused from due to interference from these two sources. Uh, right, and the fact is that sound, okay, the frequencies are combining and becoming a nothing in one location versus twice the amplitude in the other case, but light isn't doing that. Because you can't bang a photon into a photon. <laughs> it's a simple rule. You can bang air into air, you can bring water into water, but you can't bang a photon into a photon. Well now, I want to show you Young's famous experiment of getting diffraction fringes with light. And so, so it's not really Young's experiment. So he's doing a different experiment, an interesting one, but it's not Young's experiment. So, I'll be back. All right, continuing. Establishing the wave theory of light. We're going to use slits instead of pinholes. It's fair to do so because if you look at my diagram here, you realize that if there's a slit here and two parallel slits here, you can regard this as a series of pinholes and they all form their fringes on top of each other so you get them in the same position and reinforcing each other. We're using slits instead of pinholes because... <laughs> so it's more light is the simple answer. Um, but it really doesn't matter. You're just taking away all of the pattern that would go in all the other directions except the one horizontal pattern. You get so much more light. When one realizes how difficult it is to set up this young experiment. So we know that's sort of wrong. That it's really easy. People just do it with a needle and they create the fringe pattern. So we know, especially with lasers, it's really, really easy. Um, but it's even pretty easy with regular light as long as you know to put a, a small aperture in front of your light source so you get the parallel as possible photons. But otherwise it's a pretty easy experiment to do. And can't but admire Young for having done it originally. Uh, instead of a, the sun, as Young used, using an arc lamp there. So the problem with using the sun was is that it's not one color of light. And so you end up with the red pattern on top of the blue pattern, and they're blending into each other. So it, it just makes it a bit messier. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Coates is now turning that on, and in front of that arc lamp, is an extremely fine slit. Here, about eight feet away. So he doesn't tell you how fine. I don't know why he wouldn't just say, well, it's, you know, it's uh, eight wavelengths of light. It's really, really small. Um, but he doesn't say that. Okay, we've got two slits, again, very close together. So obviously, if he made them very far apart, that is further apart, like a half a millimeter, or even a quarter of a millimeter, that would indicate um, uh, perhaps a hundred wavelengths could fit in that. Um, you know, so you're talking about a lot of little bars of light. 
about a millimetre apart. And there's a shutter in front of one of them. I can open it by turning this knob here, bearing both slits, or close it, leaving only one so it's pretty hard to see, and that's disappointing. He's saying this is a millimeter apart, which is really interesting. So there are two single slits a millimeter apart. And so what he's going to end up doing is, I guess it's worth drawing it before we see it, just to be clear on what's going to happen. So I will once again pause. All right, should be back. All right, so got to just ignore the kind of messy drawing. Light source, little tiny opening that obviously the light will spread as it goes out, and it has to spread across the entire distance between the two slits that he claims is a millimeter, which is a lot, uh, but their slits are very small. So the slits are infinitesimally small, so they're like going to be 10 wavelengths kind of thing. Very, very, very tiny slits. So the point source argument is in play here in the sense that we're only going to get a single slit pattern anyway. But what he's going to actually do isn't going to be casting it on a screen. So you're not going to see any of the fringes, actually, the external fringes. So there's two kinds of um, diffraction, front and frere, and frere, whatever the, you know, two names that are not very pronounceable. And so um, those two F types of diffraction are um, in play. So the one describes when the fringes are going out, that is when both lines are going in the same direction. The other happens inside of this tiny one millimeter um, in terms of the light going, creating the central maxima essentially. And that's what he's going to end up viewing is the inside of the central maxima because of the way he's doing the experiment. He's really not seeing any of the fringe light. <laughs> he's seeing the light inside of the cone, okay, between that one millimeter. All right, so that should be understood um, because it's a very unusual way of doing. Traditionally, the I haven't seen anybody else do the experiment this way, so that's why it's kind of interesting at minimum, but it's not the same it's not the same as the traditional let's see the, these fringe patterns because he's really not going to see the external fringes which are in all the other experiments is the glaring thing that you see um, and people have already speculated that there's got to be fringes inside of those fringes and there are <laughs> you just can't see them all right so anyway let's put the video back and you'll see what I'm talking about. It opened. We'll see the fringes over in the distance on my right. We have to use slits very close together indeed. And look at the fringes at the distance. Because you must remember how short the wavelength of light is. There are about 40 to 50,000 light waves in an inch. Again, we admire Young having got the effect with a very crude apparatus at his disposal. So we're talking about a thousandth of a millimeter is probably what he's, he's down to a pretty small slit to cut the number of wavelengths to an incredibly small number. And that's the reason why you can see them in the central maxima is there's so few. So now if I go over here uh, with this piece of ground glass, I'll place myself so the so it's just a piece of glass with a bunch of scratches in it so now you can see because the light diffracts off the glass and it makes it so you can see um, intensities of light fringes fall on my ground glass and with the slits as close as this in spite of the short wavelength of light the fringes will be far enough to see with the naked eye So he's actually looking into the slits. I mean, you know, so, so yeah, hard to describe that. Um, he's, yeah, it really has to be looking into them. So the image on his glass is projected by the light that's technically converging. And because he's looking at it on this round glass, it's exaggerated in terms of its spreading 
through the glass, and that's what's making it visible. But he's looking inside of one millimeter. Well, now I've placed myself in the line of the optical beach. So if I could have the lights down now, please. When I hold up my ground glass, what I see here uh, is the image cast by a single slip. All right, so look at the size of that. All right, I don't know how exactly to make that um, notable. Uh, you know, we could just do a little thing compared to here. It's only one-fifth of the whole arrow. You know, you could do that. You know, in this actual image from this old, old video, you can almost see that there are lines inside of that, but they're just very faded. But anyway, continuing. So just watch the size change. Well, here, I'll just leave the arrow, and we should be able to see it. It's a white patch of light, and on either side of it, there are uh, colored fringes what are called diffraction fringes. And so what are called diffraction fringes, they're the same phenomena. Professor Lewin makes a speech in one of his videos where he points out you can't call these things different causes. They all have to be caused by the same phenomenon. They can't be caused by different things. It's all light bending, and it's bending for a reason. And the simple reason is the surface <laughs> is causing it. And he'll prove that in the end of this video, which is ironic. He basically proves the surface is what's causing the effect. These have nothing whatever to do with Young's effect. It's a rather more complex effect. So you... obviously it's not a complex effect. It is exactly the thing that causes the effect. And you're just amplifying it when you put more than one light source to create an amplification of the effect. You get when light passes through a narrow. When you have more sources, then you'll have more things to, to reinforce the pattern that exists with the single surface. But it's not a very good pattern until you add more sources of photons. But now, if I ask Mr. Coates to uncover the second slit, it would have been nice just to leave this on and uncover it just so you could see the fact that what it's going to do is basically double the size of the image. This patch of light falls on top of the first one, and I can see that the patch is covered. There, you can see a much bigger pattern, okay, twice the size, and um, so that's the key point. And then you can see that there's no, as you do get in the patterns I showed, the traditional double slit patterns for the fringes, there should be a central maxima that's double. There's no double central maxima here. So you just have an on and off. And you can just count how many bars there are here. One, two, three, four, five. Um, coming from each side. So that would be six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and you'd say, well, that's how many wavelengths fit in between the sit slits that he has open. Um, so it's basically telling you how wide the slits are by the number of bars you can see. Okay. With beautifully regular fine black and white fringes. And so this is looking inside that one millimeter. This is looking at just the central hunk of light at the fringes created by the light intersecting from going the same direction. One goes this way and one goes a little bit that way, but they're both going the same direction. So one's got a different angle, there'll be another spot. This one's at this angle, it'll be another spot. So it's just showing you that you still have cancellations, if you want to call them, um, but the better word would be you have in phase and out of phase inside of that central maxima. These are the actual Young's fringes. So they're not Young's experiment. Young did it by casting the image, not by looking into the image. Which he observed and so proved the wave theory of light. So obviously he said it again, prove the wave theory of light. So they didn't even try to explain it with some other theory. And again, right now, he's going to basically prove the other theory, in the sense he's going to prove what does it have to do with waves? 
I mean, you're just saying basically the surface causes it. Any surface will cause the effect. And you amplify the effect by adding surfaces. Now, why were scientists so reluctant to believe in the wave theory of light? So this is the joke part, right? <laughs> because it's like, yeah, who was reluctant? Uh, just like your silly kinetic energy theory of energy, they fell for it really easy. They didn't put up any resistance. They didn't even try to explain that, well, it doesn't create, you know, the central maxima is wrong. There's two different patterns. The double slit with open slits creates a different, completely different pattern. Where are all those arguments? Obviously, where's the resistance? Where's there any indication of any resistance? It's because of the sharpness of shadows. They could not understand how light, if it was waves, could cast such very sharp shadows. We don't often see these sharp shadows because most sources of light to which we're accustomed are rather broad, so that the shadows are fuzzy. Uh, the uh, light sources, it's not about broad, it's about the fact that they're coming from a lot of different directions. If we have a really fine source of light, like I've got here, and now if Mr. Coates positions it to cast its light on this screen, and I switch it on, and now if Mr. Coates holds up his arm in front of the screen, I want you to see how sharp those details are. Although his arm is... <laughs> it's kind of creepy. <laughs> he could have picked something else. It's just, you know, how hairy his arm is is not that exciting. But clearly the hairs are very small. And so, again, this theory that the wavelength of light is um, completely controlling, well, clearly to some extent it's not because those are very small surfaces and they're still casting very sharp shadows. So even tiny little details are um, pretty sharp considering a wave theory, uh, the circular wave idea. Quite a long way away from the screen. That is the effect which puzzled them so much. Could I have the lights up now, please? Now, they couldn't believe that waves could cast shadows like that. Jan himself couldn't understand it, although he believed in the wave theory of light. It was left later to the great Fresnel to explain how it... So Fresnel is one of the guys uh, with the diffraction, you know, in one direction versus diffraction. There's diffraction in and then there's diffraction out. And the out is created by the two sources going in the same direction. The in is two sources opposite each other. The answer is that the shadows are so sharp with light because the wavelength of light is so extremely short compared with the size of the objects that are casting the shadow. If we have very short waves compared with the size of the obstacle, then you get a sharp shadow behind that obstacle. So they have, they'll do no evidence with actual photons and tiny, tiny, tiny surfaces to demonstrate that's true. So it's not what you call qualitative, okay, in the sense that there's no, this piece of evidence is more a story than it is shown to be actually true. If on the other hand, the waves are long compared to the size of the obstacle, for instance, sound waves, which go round corners quite easily, then the waves bend right into the shadow, and in fact the obstacle hardly makes any difference. The waves seem to heal themselves as they go past it. Well, now I'll, I'll turn down the lights again, and we'll just show that with our wa Young's wave drop. So you can't really do this with photons because there is no wave to heal itself. All right, what there is is real okay um scatter and it's it's real it's not fake in the first place mr coates has got a dipper the one like those we used before which gives very short waves he's placed so it's going to be very short waves that are very weak waves and then he's going to compare that to very slow waves that are very high in intensity so it's not exactly a fair comparison
in front of that an obstacle which is of a fair size compared with the wavelength and I think you will see that behind that obstacle there's quite a sharp shadow. Right, shall we start it going now? There, do you see the shadow behind the obstacle uh, with these short waves? Now, Mr. Coates is going to replace this slipper that makes the short waves with a very slow vibrator, which makes quite long waves. The same obstacle will be placed in the path, but I hope you'll see that the waves reheal themselves and go on much as before. There, now we'll set that dipper going. There are the long waves in the trough, and you... It's, I mean, it's still a significant distortion, so it's, a, you know, this is a marginal proof in my opinion but again it, it doesn't go to anything critical <clears throat> creating shadows isn't really the the key feature the fact is the surfaces are what's causing fringes that's the important part see the obstacle really is making practically no difference at all well it's not really practically no difference at all right could i have the lights up now uh, on the other hand, uh, I mean, it's clear that the higher the frequency, the higher the resolution, the lower the frequency, the less resolution. So if you want to see some small stuff, you're better looking uh, in higher and higher frequency light. So the smaller the thing you're using to see with, the more detail you can see. Light does bend ground obstacles to a small extent. I'll show that again with the same setup with which we showed the fringes. The young fringes, like as in his pinhole experiment. We've got again uh, a lantern over there on my left with an extremely fine slit in front of it. Uh, this time we'll take away the double slit that we've got here and replace it First of all, by a little shutter, which I've got here, which has an extremely sharp, fine edge on one side. And what I want you... <laughs> yeah, well, uh, they all should have that whenever you're doing these experiments. ...to observe is that the light does, to a certain extent, bend round this edge. And we'll then... And it's, it's going to bend as fringes. ...replace that edge by this little window here in which we placed an ordinary sewing needle. And which is going to create the more, certainly the spreading pattern. Now whether he sees that or not, right, he's not going to see that because the way he's viewing the experiment, he's not casting the image on a thing, so he's not going to see the fringes because they're too weak. And he's only going to see, the, again, the center. You'll see the rather pretty pattern made by the light which bends round the sewing needle. Well now, I'll go to my position for uh, viewing these effects with my ground glass screen, and I hope to show you that light really does bend round corners. So what it is is scattered at corners. It's bent away from the corner, it's bent in towards the corner, it's bent in all directions based on what happened to it when it by, by the surface. So however many electrons it hits will decide how much it's bent. And um, that's it. Well, I'll position myself again now so as to see these effects. The, the truth is it's pieces of photons. Photon comes in, part of the photon is broken off by the surface hitting electrons those pieces end up still going to the destination but they're being bent so they're they're bent this way and they're bent that way and the ones that can reconstruct a photon are traveling in the same directions from the two sources and that creates the fringes it's, and it's the coats uh, in the case of the double slit would be the four sources uh, turns the arc on and we turn the lights down uh, we'll replace the, the two slits that I had before by a wind. So if that was the two slits, let me, let me just see what that looked like. 
It, it doesn't look like any millimeter of down. Uh, we'll replace the, the two. Okay. So the two slits looks like it must have been a wire between them because we don't see any two slits here, right? See, we can only see a single slit indicating that there must be a wire in between the two slits. So the two slits weren't a millimeter apart. There was just a wire between them. Two slits that I had before by a window with a very sharp edge. Now, what <laughs> so, yeah, obviously the slits had to have a very sharp edge. What I want you to notice is that on either side, really, the edge... So this is, again, the same kind of diffraction going in, all right, not going out, because he's not casting it on the screen. But it's a single surface, so you get a very weak pattern, where if he adds another surface over here, it would reinforce the first pattern, and it would get four times brighter, something like that. There are effects that show the light is bending right into the shadow. Uh, you notice that just outside the edge... So obviously the shadow edge is a lot sharper than the non-shadow edge. So it's indicating, in a sense, the opposite. Very little light is being bent this way because there's no other source to reinforce that. Where going the other way light from the top part can still hit light going this way, so there's some hope to create fringes. But they're going to be weak because there's no real second source. The second source is the same source. It's only one source, but you're doing... Some of the photons are at a little bit of an angle, so they can actually create um, the pattern um, out of one surface. But it's incredibly faint, as is made obvious. The light is brighter than it would be normally. Then again, outside, was a dark... So it's just the same thing as the other experiment, and except, look, you got this big, huge maxima part here. So that's the other part that's kind of funny, where that was missing in that original experiment. So the original experiment looks something like this, except for this big, giant bar. And if he just puts another surface over here, he's back to the original experiment he did. So, I mean, you know, that's the trick of it is the more sources, the more capacity to have the back-in-phase event. Line, and then it fades away into the general illumination. Well, those effects are due to light which has come around the edge. It's an interference effect rather too complicated to explain. So it's too complicated to explain. <laughs> okay, so it says you. But anyway. Uh, Fennell first explained it, but it shows certainly the lights going around the edge. Now Mr. Coates will replace that window by one in which we've placed a needle. And here the diffraction effects are quite complicated. You can only see the bright line up. There, so you can kind of see that you're, you're seeing the pattern in both inside and outside, because this is essentially the double slit, but it's such a small double slit experiment, you have no hope of seeing the actual fringes because it's such a tiny amount of light and such a tiny thing he's looking into it as. So if he cast that on a screen, then you would have saw, seen uh, the double slit pattern here and the single slit where there's just the one surface of the needle. So he's looking through the eye of the needle, which is kind of just breaking the idea where it'd be more interesting if, if he just looked at the whole needle. But the, the darkness on the inside is being created by the fact that it's very few photons going through there. And there's a lot of surface there. And so a lot of photons get broken. And that's why you're just seeing the three little bars. I the shadow, but I think some other fringes and a curious fringe right in the middle of the shadow of the needle. Obviously, the light is not going dead straight. The waves are bending round the corners. Well, obviously, I don't think so. Obviously, <laughs> obviously, it's just being bent by the surfaces. It's being scattered by interacting with electrons on the surfaces. All surfaces are covered in electrons. The photons are going through a field of electrons. Uh, there's clearly good reason to believe uh, surfaces aren't smooth on the photonic 
scale. So a photon doesn't see a surface as a surface, like a flat surface. A photon is seeing <laughs> there's a bunch of electrons here, and then there's nucleuses way over here. Yeah. That's what it sees. Now if I have the lights up, please. Here's a very simple experiment you can try for yourselves. Uh, look at a distant street lamp through a window. Ah, uh, you are. Just push your fingers together. <laughs> you know, look at your computer screen. And up oh, there's the little lines. They just pop right in. So, yes, it's very easy to create the idea of fringe light. And move your head so that the street lamp just disappears behind the edge of the window. Now, if you look, you will see that the edge has a bright white line along it. And you can see that even if you move your head quite a long way into the geometrical shadow, as it's called. This, of course, again, is due to light, which, light waves which have bent around the edge. All right, so no wave bent. It's just photons being scattered, and you're getting some of them as remade photons. They're back in phase, and you can see it as a photon. But it's being created by different points on the surfaces is where the light's actually coming from. Well, it was interference fringes like this, which led Young to assert that light must consist of waves. He was quite right, it started a new chapter. So he was quite wrong, and it started a new chapter of let's do physics wrong, because now they invented fake explanations involving many worlds, entanglement, uh, randomness, all kinds of spooky events are now possible in the very rigid and reliable universe became somehow some sort of mushy um, woo <laughs> uh, place full of a bunch of things popping in and out of existence all kinds of nonsense ESP particles in the history of optics and the Royal Institution is proud that in the year 1800 Thomas Young was one of the professors here and gave lectures in our theatre about these effects. Okay, uh, so, um, yeah, so it's just wrong. And as I pointed out, um, there's good reasons to understand it to be wrong. And the biggest thing to understand is the fact that this wave coming out of the surface thing, okay, that can't be the answer for the double slit because we know this distance isn't going to be the right distance. If you want to get the right answer, you have to use this distance or you have to use this distance, but you can't use the distance between those centers, those wave centers. That won't get you the right answer. And certainly in the single slit, you've just got you're just dead in the water in terms of explaining anything because the only way you can make two waves is to put them on the surfaces there's no explanation for why two waves would pop out of a single opening but, you know <laughs> it always looks kind of vulgar can't do much for that you know it's just the way it turns out uh anyway so um yeah so it's bullshit it's not waves, it's particles. And then this is even before you get into all the other stuff that proves the fact in terms of the uh, ultraviolet catastrophe and, uh, you know, Einstein's uh, theory of, um, you know, the photoelectric effect kind of establishes there's good reason to understand it has to be in quantized bits and what really is bullets. And you can break the arrangement of the bullets and then you can put the bullets back in sequence again. So it's just about putting things in phase and out of phase. And phase doesn't mean waves, it just means in sequence. You have two bullets flying together, or you have two bullets that are out of phase. And it's the same argument. When they're in phase, it's a photon. When they're out of phase, it's not a photon. All right. 
So, till the next time, and such, and so forth, and whatnot. I think that's enough.